revolution in talk radio. Liberty Talk Radio, where the critical thinking will defrag your mind of propaganda-ridden viruses induced by mass media news programming. No BS here, just the facts. And now we present to you America's quintessential iconoclastic anomaly. Wow. In talk radio, your host, Joe Cristiano. Welcome, everyone, to Liberty Talk Radio. It's America's libertarian voice broadcasting from our studio in Tulsa, Oklahoma, to around the world. I'm your host, Joe Cristiano, and this is your antidote to popular talk radio. Today we have as our guest Mr. Michael Swanson. He's the author of several books. The two most recent books is The Warfare State, The Cold War Origins of the Military-Industrial Complex and Their Power Elite, 1945 to 1963, the cover on it has President Eisenhower when he gave the, that, inf- that, that famous speech warning us about the, the uh, perils of a strong military industrial complex. However, today we will be discussing primarily, if, if we have time, we'll, we'll touch on this book, but we'll be talking about the stock market bubble bust uh, of 2015 and beyond. This book I just finished reading, and I suggest that you do get that if you have any interest in watching in protecting your your assets uh, mike is also uh, runs the website wallstreetwindow.com mike thank you very much for being on our program oh thanks for having me it's great to talk with you yeah. i do want to uh, mention to our, our listeners that if you would like to call in with a question or comment our telephone number and we'll show it on the screen right hervey okay we'll show it on the screen 646-652-4620 that's 646-652-4620 and press the one button so we know that you you're just not listening in on the phone that you want to ask a question okay well uh i you know i this is the first time i met you but i didn't realize that you were going to write a book which, which is basically my autobiography by the way you know that <laughs> <laughs> when I read this book, Mike, I mean, I identified with every single error that, that you suggest that we don't make in investing. I did it in spades. Um, I identified with most of it. I've been in the commodities uh, investment business now for about 20, 25 years, and, and I've made every mistake in here. Let me tell you, what I like about this book, it's, first of all, it's, it's not overwhelming. It's not that long. You can read it in a few sessions. But it's in plain English. It tells, it explains what to do, what not to do, and why. And you don't have to be a financial analyst or a uh, stockbroker or a uh, or a commodities broker to understand the lingo in this book. It's plain and simple, and it really came to light so many of the things that brought to light so many of the things that uh, that I that occurred to me because of decisions that I made. Had I only re- read this book 15 years ago, I'd only be about 10 times richer than I am now. But better late than never, right, Mike? Well, I can say the same thing because even though you know I've been an investing professional for, for a long time uh, now, uh, the book, the things in it are lessons I've learned. And you know, I, I've pretty much, um, every single year I've been in the market, I've pretty much made money except one and that, and that was a bad year so you don't want bad years you know and, oh, yeah. and when you have one you want to learn from them and make sure that they never happen again so that's you know there's a chapter in there about managing your money and, and avoiding risk while trying to maximize returns at the same time by being properly diversified in a group of uh, funds that aren't all trading together and then making sure that uh, you maintain that so uh, what I advocate in the book and, and, and do myself is to have about uh, f- to own five different funds, 20% in each one that aren't all trading together. So personally, I own gold, I own a gold stocks fund, a commodities fund, and, and several others. And what people tend to do, though, uh, just about everybody, uh, is they'll say, well, I want to be safe. I'm going to put half my money in the stock market and half my money in treasury bonds to be diversified. But then what will happen is the stock market will go up for a long time. And next thing you know, they're not 50% invested, but they're 80% or 90% invested in the stock market. Then it goes down for a couple years. Then they're like, ah, what happened to my money? So you you have to make sure that doesn't happen by maintaining this, you know, if you're 50-50, make sure you stay 
roughly that every periodically review it and so right. forth. And, but I'm doing that, you know, much more frequently than every year. I'll bet many people are very much like me. They may buy, I usually buy at the right time. I very rarely have bought at a really bad time. I'm usually pretty, pretty right on when it comes to when to buy. My problem is that um, I, once I buy, I hold, and I hold too long, and this is where I lose the money. Now, which means I have to wait. I don't buy junk stocks, but then I have to wait through this tumultuous time when if I would have sold at, a, at the proper time, I would have preserved my wealth, and then when it went back up again, I would have bought three to five times as many shares as I had before, but I'm so obstinate, you know, I, you know, as it goes careening down, I mean, I hold on tight, <laughs> which I, I wonder if, how pervasive that is in, in, in you know, to, to the amateur investor, which I would consider myself an amateur investor. I, I really think that's pervasive for everybody, whether you're an amateur or a hedge fund manager or, or a professional or whatever. Um, you know, I, I've talked to people of, of all, you know, walks of life or whatever, and what tends to happen is, no matter if they're a professional pro or managing lots of money, they tend to get locked in on one market uh, and trade that market or that one trend. So, uh, for example, myself, uh, you know, I've switched these trends that I've traded over the years. So in 2000 and 2000, from 2000, 2002, I was shorting lots of internet stocks, but in 2002, I bought gold stocks and I put all my money into it. And, and I think it was February, you know, I don't remember how many stocks I bought, but it was, let's say it was 20 of them and they went up like 80%. <laughs> I mean, you right. know, from, from that February to July and I had a, a partner I was doing this with too. Uh, we, we shared an office and so forth and I went out of town and they topped out and in three days I, I sold three days later from the top and I made 10% instead of 80% or whatever right, it was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My buddy sold out and broke even. It was like, this is that, I mean, I've never experienced something like that before. But the, the thing is that uh, over the, after that, you know, I, I would trade these gold stocks uh, from from then to about 2007 and be quicker to get out you know so that would happen to me again and then looking back over that time frame I actually figured out that if I would have just put 20% of my money and held it during those times I would have beat all the trading even if that big drawdown yeah. that I experienced yeah. You know. Why do people have, as I do, an emotional attachment <laughs> to, to my mutual funds? You know, I, I don't understand this. Um, now, uh, on the other side, when it, for example, I have uh, several mutual funds in the commodities area, pr specifically gold, silver, and, and platinum, or whatever, and uh, rhodium, and um, um, uh, they went down to an all-time low. But at least I had the presence of mind to invest at that time, so I double down at the right time, but I'm have to wait to come up. Why do people have this emotional attachment? What is it that, is it that we're lazy or something? Or we, 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 no. we're just wishful thinkers or we're optimists or something or what? What is it? Well, I, I can only speak for myself and, and I know what happened to me during, at different times. And it's basically, I think in my own case, uh, it was basically greed, you know, that I would be locked locked in, a, a, I'm just using gold as an example back then, but locked in this gold thing, think what's well, just working, it's doing so well, I'll hold that, I don't have to do anything else. And you just get kind of a tunnel vision on this one thing. And, and I also did the same thing actually um, in shorting stocks too, uh, in that last bear market from 2007 to 2009. I was actually short in the summer and May did really well during the decline there. But when the market turned around, um, I didn't stop trying to short the market until like two or three, two months, I think it was after the bottom and it had already gone up like 30% or something. And I wasn't looking to buy stocks or, you know, until I was like, oh crap, it's, it's going up now. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what I think happens is even if, if you have something that's working, especially for a long time for years, you just you do get kind of lazy, I think, because it's just working, and and but obviously 
you know, market trends change. And my solution to that uh, for myself and what I put in the book is, again, to not bet on one market, but to be in multiple markets or trends. Uh, right now, you know, personally, I'm doing gold in commodities and trying to short the stock market too. Although that's kind of a temporary thing, you know, you can't really short the, anything right. for and think oh, I'm going to do that for ten years or something. Right. So I'll be looking to get out of that, and I don't know what I'll buy. Maybe a foreign market, maybe the Russian stock market. I'm really not sure, but but I'm definitely not going to be all in, you know, gold or all or commodities like I had done at times in the past, yeah. just well, to escape that trap. <laughs> well, you know, in, in concert with your book, back in the early 2000s, when the tobacco companies were being sued. Uh, because of the, the the effect of smoking on 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 people's health, and everyone was bailing out. Uh, I never forget. I, I spoke to my wife and I said, "You know, you and I should buy a hundred shares of R. J. Reynolds and Philip Morris." And she says, "But everyone's selling." I mean, that everyone's right. I said, "It's got to be a great time to buy." Well, we did. We just bought, I think, a hundred shares of each one, and it was like one was like twelve dollars a share, and there was eighteen dollars a share. It was down from like sixty dollars a share. And you know, to this day, we made a forty times return on those on those uh, stocks. Forty times, not forty percent. Forty times. I mean, that four thousand dollars we put in is now was over a hundred thousand dollars. And uh, because they split, and then they, um, um, uh, are, uh, what, what do you call them? Um, uh, one of the food company. Uh, one of the food companies. Which one is it? Um, that was oh, all Kraft? Kraft, yeah, I'm sorry. I don't know why I couldn't think of it. Kraft split off, and of course, we got stock in Kraft, and then that went up, and, and so it, it kept on doubling itself. But this is what you're, you're subscribing to in your book. The point is, is that you have to buy at the right time, and you explain in your book when that right time is. Could you explain to our audience when it's time to buy? Well, okay. What, what I do is break a market up into phases. Uh, a, a, a basing phase, a bull market phase, and I call it a, a topping phase, then a bear market. And these, the, these phases can last for several years each. Uh, but the way to identify what the phase is, uh, and that's the key thing, you got to figure out what's the phase of the market because then you can see when it's going to change or decide what to do. So I just look at the 150 and 200 day moving average. 200 day moving average is really the most important one. You can just look at that. But it just takes the average price to, you know, over 200 days. And all, if you go to stockcharts.com, you can type in whatever the symbol is you're looking at in the market and see this indicator. And when a market is in a bull market, uh, this indicator tends to go up and act as a price support level when you're in a topping market it tends to flatten out and, and go sideways and then a bear market it, it turns down and the prices will remain below that moving average um so when you and then afterwards you can have a bottoming market where then now they flatten out and and go sideways and form a base and eventually you break out to start a new bull market so if you look at for example we use gold uh it, it, it had a nice bull market from 2009, but in 2011 it topped out, and the moving average just went sideways for about over a year, or a year and a half. So there was all the time in the world to see that the momentum had changed and maybe something was different, and then it finally broke down uh, in the fall of 2012, and the, and the mining stocks really fell. So they started a bull, a bear market. So that meant you don't know, you know, is this going to last six months or a year? That one lasted a really long time, shocked me. <laughs> but yeah. for uh, the important thing of gold, though, is from, let's say, the beginning of last year uh, up until recently, it was in this basing phase. And I think it just broke out into new bull market because it's gone above this turn day moving average. And there's other factors, too. Uh, if you follow lots of commodities, the commitment of traders report, showed that the commercials were very, very low net short, which meant that the, the smart money they call it or were, were buying, which is a good sign, right? So, and, and this is going on with lots of commodities too, to, to, to uh, what's the word, uh, to, to back up that thesis. Uh, but then with the stock market, uh, it's not done anything. 
you know, so recently, so from 2009 to I think last year, it was in a bull market, but everyone can remember uh, 2013 and, and 14, it was just going up almost without ever falling. Right. And it was riding you know, this moving average, but it's flattened out, gone nowhere. And I think that's a, a sign of a big top. So if you put those, just those two concepts, that means the, it's really risky to be in the stock market. You're not going to really make anything. And at this point, gold looks really good, you know, because we should have a new bull market that can last for a couple of years. Yeah. Well, uh, I guess we're, we're sort of uh, in between a consolidation or correction mode, but, but the pressure is to go into the bear market mode uh, because we, we went down, we, we, we recovered somewhat, but we're having a lot of difficulty recovering. And it seems like the only time that the stock market gets a real boost is when the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee, or Yellen, um, makes uh, an inane comment um, <laughs> about interest rates which makes absolutely no sense to me. I took economics courses and I, I, I have no idea what she's talking about, neither do I understand her. She doesn't, there's no period in any sentence. It goes on for about 45 words and I lose track of what she's talking about. And, and that's the only time the market goes up. Um, it, and, and typically it goes up when she espouses or suggests that they do something detrimental to the market and it goes up. This is what I, just blows my mind. Now, you know, I'm an informed person. I watch CNBC. I, I say that in jest, believe me. But people are watching things like CNBC, and you never hear a negative tone from these guys. It's always, oh, things are getting great. Uh, here are the latest stocks to look at. This is what you should buy. It's always buy. It's very rarely sell. You know, get out of Dodge and run for your life. Yeah, definitely. And the thing is about the stock market is um, it, it's it's and, and it's I have a friend of mine I talk with quite a lot uh, and do videos with and stuff. Uh, and he's been saying to me since 2014, this is all fake. This is all artificial. And it's not real and this and that. And I just kind of let that go out one year, go in one year out the other, you know, because yeah, I'm like, ah, whatever. But but I got to say, though, that uh, I wrote this book um, in September because I was thinking that we're finally seeing the end of the bull market and it's probably topped out and, and going into a bear market. So that, that's the reason, the title of it. But then I wanted to write about this money management stuff. But um, the thing about the stock market, though, is it, it, it really isn't trading in a way, I think, that anyone in the market's really ever seen before right at least anyway <laughs> at least that I can remember <laughs> because um, you are seeing last year you would see these moves straight up or straight down and they wouldn't go anywhere uh, and the in last August uh, there was a day in which the Dow gapped down almost a thousand points and, and then recovered and what I thought was real interesting and, and had been noticing about the market uh, is uh, my friend was saying, oh, it's all artificial. It's just trading robots buying in and out. And I think there actually is a lot of truth to that uh, because if you look at uh, that gap down in, in August, I think what happened was that the market went below some technical level and the people just turned these robots off for an hour or two, and, and then they turned it back on. I really think that's why the market <laughs> did that. <laughs> it's like, this is very really crazy. Yeah. But what about the, 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 the average Joe Blow? Yeah. Uh, sort of like myself in a way, but maybe I'm, I'm a little bit more involved in, than, than many people, but not most, um, that just want a very simple formula. Say, you know, it, should I be buying now or should I be taking my money? I mean, or should I listen to my investment advisor that I have with one of the main firms that you see advertised on television where they uh, pr pr proportion your funds between uh, cash, bonds, um, equities, and then foreign equities, a certain proportion depending on your age, which I think is totally bogus because the world changes and that those proportions are not valid just because of your age, quite frankly, but that's my opinion. What do you tell? What, what, what do you tell these people? 
Well, first of all, the, the, the one thing that's happened is because the interest rates are zero, <laughs> it, it, it's, it, I don't see any reason people should really buy bonds as an investment. Right. I, it doesn't make any sense to me. You know, and now it makes sense from the standpoint that I'm just going to own these bonds in case the market falls. And then, you know, they won't fall as much or they may go up because in 2008, bonds went up substantially that year. But the problem is interest rates are already zero. So, you know, the, I think the best case is they just float around, keep, keep where they are. Maybe they can do that for a long time. Right. But in the long run, I, I think there is a, a big risk that one day there'll be a bear market in the bond market. I mean, it's just going to happen one day. Right. It's just the way markets are. And if that coincides with the stock market also being in a bear market, uh, which is what we've seen when countries have big debt crises, uh, such as Argentina or Russia in 1998 and, and, and so forth. Uh, I mean, that sounds really outlandish, but um, the thing is, it just makes it very difficult and risky for people to try to do something simple, you know, like like that, which is what, you know, the standard thing is to do just that. Put money in cash, put money in bonds, put money in stocks, just as you said. So I really think people need to be invested in gold in, in, in at least, you know, 10 or 20 percent at least, you know, I'm not, I won't say more than 20 percent, but at least 10 percent. And, and, and we could face a situation too, or for a temporary period of time, the foreign stock markets go down also, you know, they, that's what happened in 2008. So, you know, I think people should think what's the worst case scenario and, and, and be positioned to uh, weather that out. Um, I mean, I'm not trying to scare people or, you know, because you, you, you see all kinds of videos with terrible scenarios on right. the internet. Yeah. Oh, yeah. They're they're all over the place, and they after a while you get tired of watching them. You know. Yeah. Yeah. But but I think it doesn't matter uh, that you just. It, I, I think in the long term, putting some money in gold and still having some money in the stock market and you know and, and diversified like that is the key. But I really think the key is owning some gold because that's what people do not really do. And just a twenty percent gold position. Uh, you know, in the system I'm using where you divide it up, you know, in five things, uh, it boosts returns. Even even if you have uh, a years, a couple years where gold goes down, in the long run, owning gold still helps uh, maintain a, a good diversification. Right. Well, in, in that case, Mike, if you had, 20, let's say, about 10 to 20 percent in gold yeah. and, and the market has some sort of wild fluctuation on the down downturn, right? Um, all that 20, uh, 10 or 20 percent in gold will do is keep you even. Am I correct? Well, it should, but I, I, I think it could easily go up. You know, yeah, so, but, but, but it have to. It, I mean, it would have to be such a wild swing for yeah. the 20 percent to um, uh, uh, cover the 80 percent that went down. So it would have to be a phenomenal swing. Um, but if, in, if, if that's the case, why not have um, 50 percent in gold or precious metals and uh, X number in cash and then X number in divid high dividend paying stocks like the high yield Dow? Well, I, I think uh, one one could do that uh, at this point, because I do think we're going into a, a bull a bull market for a couple of years in gold. The only the only thing is that. Um, you don't want to make the mistake I was talking about earlier where let's say you do that and you put half your money in gold in for, for three or four years it just goes up tremendously and then you don't make a change you know you just keep the 50 percent and when it's because at some point you, you, even if gold goes up for five years you, you don't want to be 50 percent invested in it forever Yes, because you're going to want to get into something else. Right, so. that's the problem. That's the problem that I made. I mean, yeah. I, I I'm heavily invested in funds. Um, you know, the Vanguard fund, for example, is one, and um, the Van uh, the uh, Fidelity fund and um, uh, Franklin uh, Templeton funds, where, where um, in, in their gold funds, and they all did phenomenally well and ter terribly poor. For example, the Vanguard fund was uh, in the low 40s and went down to five dollars and fifty cents. You know, a share. Well, you can imagine 
and I had a large position there, and I didn't move one dime. All I did is kept on buying as it went down, figuring I was on a dollar cost average on my way down. But I, I, pro- I should have sold on the top, uh, near the top, and then <laughs> bought in once I, I noticed that we're, uh, we're in a bottom, and we're fluctuating around five dollars and fifty cents, six dollars. Then bought back in there. Uh, it wasn't going to go down much further than that because they'd have to close out the fund altogether. But that fund was so popular at one time. You first of all, you couldn't buy it. And if you did buy it, you had to put in at least ten thousand dollars as your initial wow. payment. Wow. So you know, um, I, I I really blew it on that one. Now, um, for for, for uh, th- there are people who will ride out a a a bear market. Um, in, instead of putting your money in bonds, isn't it better that not to ride out the bear market? but to put the money in cash, preferably, not even in treasuries because you're not getting a return, but just take the cash yourself and put in your safe deposit box or something like that so you have it on you. Well, I, well I'm not sure. Why, why, would you, why would it be better to do that than just leave it in the brokerage account? Because I have it. <laughs> because I can see it, I can touch it, I can feel it, I can, I can, I, I can caress it. You know, when I have nothing better to do, you know, and um, when it's on on an account somewhere, I'm uh, subject to the electronic system and yeah, getting yeah. my money. I'm just sort of from a safety point of view, basically. Yeah, sure. That I, I like things in my. I'm a very possessive person. Ask my wife. You know, I'm terrible. You know. <laughs> well, I, I gotta say, I, I gotta safety deposit box somewhere with some stuff in it so <laughs> yeah well yeah that's why so, so you have access to it you want to sure. make sure this bank is not going to close up or right. is, is is not going to be raided by some government official and take everything out right you know no it makes sense yeah so um in, in this mark let's say we have about three minutes to go before we, we okay. stop for a break but let me ask you this question before we go on break um what i i'd, I'd like to discuss is um, not so much the market, but I'd like to get, when we come back from the break, I'd like to talk about the economy because okay. the, uh, the economy eventually will dictate where the market goes. We know it's manipulated now based on negative, you know, if there's negative interest rates, the market will go up because people have no place to put their money but the market. But we know most of the companies in the S&P are actually uh, in a bear market, there's a few big ones that are in a bull market because that's where all the big money's going. So it makes the S&P look like, oh, everyone's buying, it's doing well when it's really not. Same thing with the Dow and the same thing with NASDAQ. Uh, you know, a few com- companies are really bolstering the overall price of those indexes. But um, uh, uh, w- we know that's, that's a, f- a, a false indicator, so we don't want to put our money there. Uh, if we're not going to put our money there, you know, what 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 are we going to do with it? You know, what's the safest thing to do, and um, how will it, how will the economy affect that? For example, there are people, and, and you know, we, on the internet, you you can find anything on the internet. There's even someone in, in, in on the internet that said I was a nice guy. I mean, so you find all sorts of falsehoods, <laughs> you know, uh, in in that. Uh, if if we have a a a, a debt burden that the um, world market considers to be um, unsustainable, they may withdraw from using the dollar as the world's reserve currency or using it as reserve or may want to cash in their dollars for a stronger, more stable currency. I mean, it's like, you know, there's a there's a room full of financial people and there's one door and it's slightly open and everyone's having a good time, but everyone has one eye on the door. As soon as one person leaves, everyone bails out. No one wants to be the last person in. And I almost look at, look at our economy that way in that the whole world economy is shaky. Everyone's watching everybody. And I think Jim Ricketts talks about the snowflake theory, you know, that one snowflake that hits you know, hits the ground one that, that you can't hardly wait, but it's that one snowflake that starts the avalanche. And so when we come back from break, I'd like you to discuss uh, with us about the world economy and, and how you would play the market relative to the world economy. And what, what, what you project will happen. Okay. So okay, I'll give you sure. some time to think about that. It's now about 1130. We'll just stop for break. Mike, if you just stay with us for 60 seconds, we'll be right back. 
You're listening to Liberty Talk Radio. Political talk derived from a historical perspective. Not always palatable, but good food for thought. Pure libertarian talk with host Joe Cristiano. LibertyTalkRadio.com. Express Test is your go-to company for on-site occupational health testing services. That's right. We sit on-site. That means we will meet you at your facility for a free health and occupational safety consultation. Express Test specializes in hearing conservation, respiratory protection, and employee safety. We can help you establish viable programs tailored to your business and employee needs. For your free consultation, call 918-743-2929 or visit us at ExpressTest.com. That's 918-743-2929 or ExpressTest.com. Ranch Acres Audiology is about caring, about getting the most out of life, about personal attention. Sometimes helping someone with their hearing is really helping them with more than just hearing. That's the goal of my practice. That's what my goal has been for 20 years. You're invited to attend our next free Lunch and Learn seminar. Call us today, 918-749-7711. This isn't your typical talk radio show. This is Liberty. Liberty Talk Radio. Welcome back, everyone. This is Joe Cristiano. You're listening to Liberty Talk Radio. With us today, we're pleased and proud to have Michael Swanson, author of the book, The Stock Market Bubble Bust of 2015 and Beyond, exactly what we're going through now. And on our second half, um, we're going to ask Mike to give us a uh, synopsis or uh, his opinion of the world economy, how it's going to affect it, affect the stock market, and what how you should position yourself to protect whatever money you have in there now, because right now it's a very false economy, at least in my opinion, and the stock market is arbitrarily and artificially being propped up, so it can go any time. Please give us a call at 646-652-4620, 646-652-4620. Make sure you press the one button if you want to... Uh, 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 Break in, ask a question, or make a comment. Otherwise, you can just listen to the program on, on the phone. But make sure you press one so we can distinguish you from the other callers. Thank you very much. Mike, thank you very much for holding on. And here is your book. And now tell me, what's going to happen with the world economy and what should I do about it? I want to get filthy, filthy rich. <laughs> well, um, actually, I'll tell you, the best thing I've read, I mean, first of all, you know, when people talk about the economy, what they think is going to happen, I, you know, we all have opinions on that. And I don't really make my investment decisions based on projecting that. I really look at charts and fundamentals of, you know, focusing on companies in the United States. So I'll get to that in a, in a second. But uh, that said, there's a really good book uh, I would recommend. It's called The Global Minotaur. Uh, and it's written by the former finance minister of Greece. And it's about the global economy and what he says is wrong with it, okay? And he claims that, uh, and he's looking at Europe and, and the United States in particular, that the biggest problem is simply giant debt, you know? Right. The kind of obvious thing, right? We had the 2008 uh, financial crisis, the government, uh, turn a crisis that was basically involving the balance sheets of banks into uh, a government debt problem. It's not a problem yet, but they took those debts, put them on the Federal Reserve balance sheet, and the European banks did exactly the same thing. Now, what's happened in Europe is that their economy has never really recovered. Uh, the Greece economy has gone, you know, down the toilet, you could say. It's a total disaster. The unemployment is 20%, still is. It's been like that for several years. And his book is basically saying that they, the Greek people in government have no way out of this without getting off the euro and, and going on their own currency and doing a complete devaluation, that they're just trapped. And he proposes, you know, he's, he's really a socialist, let's say, and he's trying to propose all these government reforms and stuff to try to do this and that, which, you know, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't know if I agree with his prescription, but his diagnosis of, of the world economy, I think, is, is very is very valid and interesting. And it's the best book I've read that, that really goes into that. But the key problem, he says, is what 
we've experienced since the 1970s uh, is this rise in debt in, in stock markets uh, that started in the United States, then trickled over into the rest of the world. And the key event was when Nixon took the dollar off of the gold standard. Because before that, uh, the United States government and other governments, for that matter, uh, could not just print unlimited amounts of money, make unlimited deficits without uh, losing their gold. Because the gold was backed by the U.S. dollar. Now, when they, when they what happened was the Vietnam War and Lyndon Johnson and, you know, our government. The great society. Up, type you know, all that. But anyway, that's a whole other topic. <laughs> but yeah. the, 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 they'll make a long story short. We took the dollar off the gold standard. That enabled our government to print lots of money. They didn't know what was going to happen at first. They were actually scared. Uh, Nixon didn't know if it would work or not. Uh, I've read the Federal Reserve transcripts of the meeting uh, the day this happened. Uh, and they, the Federal Reserve people didn't know Nixon was going to do it. And, and it's actually fascinating. They say that, oh, this will just last a week. <laughs> and we'll be back to normal. Well, of course, here we are. It's 2016, you know, uh, which is just like mind blowing. But anyway, um, what, what has happened, though, is this created great you know, gains in the stock market. And with the issuance of more and more debt, you know, has helped our economy grow. But starting, let's say, in, in the 1990s, uh, each issuance of debt uh, resulted in less and less growth. Uh, of, uh, you know, so now we are with almost no real growth in the United States and Europe is pretty much in recession. We see Japan has been suffering before we did the same sort of situation. Uh, their economy, you know, they're trying to now do negative interest rates. So I just think what's really, to answer your question, what's the forecast? Uh, I think it's just pretty much more of what we're seeing. I don't think we're ever really going to have a real sustainable economic recovery until what we're seeing uh, turns into a real, another downturn or a real disaster of some sorts. I don't really know exactly how that would play out or even how long it would last. Uh, but I'll, I'll give an example of what I think is, or, or tell you what I think has caught my attention the most right now. Uh, and this was after I wrote this book. When, when I wrote the book, I was more looking at primarily the action of the stock market itself. Uh, you know, the trends of the market made me get turned more negative on it. But around December, November, I went and looked and studied a lot of the balance sheets of the Dow stocks and the S&P 500 stocks. And um, what I found uh, in, in, is that what they have done over the past couple of years, uh, starting really in 2012, they took advantage of the low interest rates uh, to issue corporate bonds debt. Uh, and they used that money to do lots of share buybacks. Instead of investing uh, in order to grow their businesses or increase sales right. or capital investment, they're just buying back shares. Now what happens is when they buy back shares, it does two things. Uh, first of all, it takes shares off the market, which means uh, the earnings per share go up because there's less shares. So right. the analysts on CNBC or whoever, they get all excited, ah, you know, the stock goes up. Uh, but uh, they also go deeper and deeper in debt. Uh, so uh, to give one example, uh, and there's probably hundreds of, there's hundreds of stocks like this, if not a thousand. Uh, if you look at Sirius Radio uh, Company, uh, they, uh, bought, they bought back $2 billion worth of stock last year. And they only made five hundred and nine million in net uh, net income, <laughs> so, so they bought back four times what they're making, and they did that by going into deeper debt. Uh, so, and they're not the only one. The the, the three M's done this, Boeing. It's just on and on and on. Uh, and what I think is happening is that this has helped prop the stock market up over the past year and a half, but I think it's unsustainable. You know, I don't see how these companies can just do this forever, but I don't know what the tipping point 
is right. you know the whole market. Well, isn't this isn't this very uh, similar to what the Russia the Soviet Union went through when they eventually collapsed because their money became worthless and the soldiers that they had stationed all over Eastern Europe uh, couldn't even get paid and no one would accept the Russian ruble because it wasn't worth anything and the soldiers were actually selling their uniforms so they can buy food. I mean, I can see this happening. Although we, we keep on th- uh, repeating the mantra that, oh, but yeah. we're America with us, you know, uh, the dollar's as good as gold. We, we keep on, it, it's like the um, those Chinese newsreel with the you know, Japanese newsreel prior to World War One, where everyone is just repeats the same lie over and over again until they believe it. And we're doing the same thing. We, we repeat the same stupid lie over and over again. And you ask the person on the street, they'll repeat the same stupid lie. But it's it, it doesn't make any sense. There has got to be a point where uh, debt becomes an issue. Uh, I, I saw an ad the other day on television. It said, no money. You want to buy a car? No money. No problem. No payments till next year. More debt. I mean, we not only have the federal debt, but we have the municipal <coughs> debt. Um, and we have a personal debt, a student debt. It, it's Everything is in the trillions of dollars. And there's no money out there to be found to pay for any of this. I mean, it, don't we become the Soviet Union of 1989? Well, the, the difference is between us and them <laughs> is when the Soviet Union collapsed, uh, it was them and, and, and some of the Eastern Bloc that, that fell apart with them. Correct. But this time, it's the United States and Europe and Japan and, you know, most of the Western world is in the same situation. Ha! So, <laughs> so, so I, I make my case, Mike. I make You made my case for me. Yes, they're all in the same sh- shape. They're in the same box as the Eastern European Bloc was uh, in 1989. Uh, only we've progressed much further. We are the new Eastern Bloc of 1989. Uh, I remember Ross Perot having a, a hissy fit because our national debt was approaching, current, the current uh, uh, amount of the national debt was approaching, listen to this now, you won't believe the amount, $4 trillion, approaching $4 trillion. I mean, today it's approaching $20 trillion, and that's if you believe the, company, uh, the, the government figures. And our underfunded debt, depending on what you include, uh, Professor Kutlikoff has it somewhere between $175 trillion to $225 trillion. That's enough dollars end-to-end to go from here to Neptune, I think, or something like that. So, I mean, there's got to be a point. I mean, Mother Nature is such that she loves equilibrium, and you can't screw with Mother Nature. I mean, no matter what you do, she always wins, always has for the past million years on earth she always will there's going to be a point where mother nature says oh by the way boys ball game's over and that's it i mean am i oversimplifying it am i being an alarmist or something or am i just maybe i should just go to a nursing home from here (laughs) no i i i think that's correct there's a there is another book that was written after the last financial crisis and it it is an academic book it's called uh uh, this time is different. Uh, it's written by two economists, and but what this book did was it studied every single financial crisis in the world uh, for the past 100 years and, and tried to figure out what causes them and what happens afterwards. And basically what happens afterwards is usually you have a period for uh, three to five years in which you have huge inflation, uh, following stock market at first, at least, and and then everything actually is okay, and you come out, and and, and the debts are basically inflated away, and things kind of eventually return to normal. So I kind of suspect that is what will happen one day uh, in the future to much of the world. Uh, I don't think it's going to be the end of the world or something, but uh, it, it will be tough for a lot of people that aren't prepared for it. Uh, definitely. Yeah. But but in the past couple of centuries, uh, at least, yeah, I guess p- past couple of centuries, there's always been one nation that had a uh, sort of a reserve currency, although they didn't call it back then, that was based on a gold standard. And typically there was not enough 
dollars outstanding, you know, in the people's hands with which to sustain an economy. And it wasn't that the banking system was so polluted as they are today. And there is no basis for our money today. So we just, um, the Federal Reserve just buys um, uh, $600 billion <clears throat> a year and just to keep things going. It's like, well, we'll buy it and put it in the box there and then everything's even. Well, it's not. Eventually, we have to pay for it. Mother Nature abhors this vacuum. And I, it, it, I don't know when it's going to happen. It may happen today or it may happen 10 years from now, but it's going to happen. And what is your best guesstimate on that? Do you have one or do you have a speculation on it? Well, you know, if you look at the Congressional uh, Budget Office, uh, they project, they claim that I think it's 2030, that if nothing is done by 2030, everything's going to blow up. But uh, I'll tell you this, uh, <laughs> they're basing those numbers on uh, rosy economic projections. Uh, I got a hold of a report, uh, I think I got this last year, or late 2014, um, and it was written by someone, uh, uh, Fred Mishkin, that's the gentleman's name. Now, this re th that name got my attention, and I'll tell you why. Uh, he was supposedly the best friend of Ben Bernanke in September 2007. He was working for the, he was on the Federal Reserve Board, and he did a report saying the real estate was going to collapse and the Fed was going to have to raise lower rates to zero. So I read this in September 2007. It was like, oh my goodness, <laughs> <laughs> and this is an internal Federal Reserve report, right? right. So he wrote another one. Uh, I think it's either in the first quarter of 2015 or first quarter of 2014. But this report uh, said that uh, everything's going to go bust in 2017 and the Fed would just have to keep. It was saying the Fed's balance sheet would end up, would be unsustainable unless the government cut the deficit and did this and that. And the Fed, in response, if this happens, would just have to print money like crazy and just do more quantitative easing and, and, and this and that. So so there's a Federal Reserve report projecting 2017. And uh, they actually had a conference about this report. Now the argument they had, they had people say this isn't right. And their argument was, well, uh, we had giant debts after World War II and it didn't matter, we grew out of that. So we can have another boom. Well, uh, if the report's correct, uh, where's the boom? It should be here by now, That's you know, right. yeah. escape yeah. the situation. Well, you know, pe people do refer back to uh, World War II and they say, look, we came out of a depression and we became the world superpower. But but no one ever asked, no matter what the problem is uh, that, that we're facing, no matter what the discussion's um, about, um, they never ask why, what were the circumstances? They think every, the world has yeah. always been exactly the same, only this one variable, you know? After World War II, there was no uh, 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 industrial economy. All the industrial economies were bombed to smithereens. We were the only ones producing anything. I mean, and we produced some real crappy stuff. You remember a, a planned obsolescence, you know? Yeah. Nothing lasted for more than 11 months because you only had a 12-month warranty. Never lasted to 12 months. And we did that intentionally so people would continue buying. We figured, well, you don't want to buy from us? Who are you going to buy it to? Japan? They, we nuked them, you know, <laughs> unless you want a radioactive toaster. And um, uh, But people don't think that way. They say, well, we were great once, we'll be great again. No one looks at history. I don't understand. Now, if using that logic, we we talk about the economy coming back, but the economy is coming back. Back to what? Based on what? We are not the um, we're, we're not the dictators of our own destiny, because it's going to be other countries that are dictate whether or not they accept the U.S. dollar. Once one major country says, no, thank you, don't want the euro dollar anymore, ball game is over. Oh, before you answer that, we have someone hanging on the wire. Can we take this phone call? All oh, right. Sure. Caller, you're on line one. Your questions or your comment, please. Um, hi, Joe. Hi, Mike. Hi. Questions. Uh, to heck, to heck with the government. What about me? I've uh, paid a guy $10,000 over the past two years. And I've now so far lost 19000 in my own account. Do I just hang in there or should I be extremely worried? 
Well, before before Mike answers, let me give you my answer. Just write a check for the amount of your um, your investments and give it to me. I'll hold on to it, okay? But now I'll put Mike on. <laughs> yeah, I don't I don't know I don't know what to say to you. To tell you the truth, I mean I don't know what 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 you know what happened or what what you're invested in or anything like that. I I really can't give personal investment advice either. I was, was I assume this guy was an investment advisor. Yeah. Uh huh. With a with a big company. Well, yeah, I, I pretty diversified. Well, I don't. What percentage loss was that though? Um, I don't know. I, well, I mean, you know, here's the thing that I mean, the stock market's you know it's down uh, probably six or seven percent off the high. It was down. Most, well, one thing. What, one thing about the market too is um, most stocks. I don't know. Are you invested in individual stocks or the stock market or like a fund or something? Uh, the market. Um, I'm, okay. I'm, I'm, it's very diversified, and and it's stocks, it's bonds, it's uh, a little bit of cash. Well, what I was going to say is, if you own lots of individual stocks, one thing that's happened is that individual stocks are actually falling worse than the market averages are as a, almost all of them are down much more than what you see the averages are down that's because they've been propped up by you know some few stocks that have kind of led things so if you have an account with lots of individual stocks it's a good chance you know you're underperforming the market and and that that would actually be the reason why it's not necessarily that the person has picked out bad stocks it's just what the stock market's doing now if you own lots of funds that you know are, are down huge amounts then i don't i don't know you may want to call him and ask him what's going on well mike in this case with yeah. her portfolio she, it sounds like she has a standard portfolio of uh, a, a little bit of cash you know bonds and and stocks and you know maybe some foreign stocks i'm just guessing but would do you not recommend to her that a certain portion of that be placed in gold, real money, if you will, gold or silver or precious metals? Well, that's what I would do if it was if it was my money. But I don't want to, you know, give personal investment advice. Oh, but that, let's get personal. Come on, we, we can get personal. It's okay. <laughs> so it's it's only one do. of our listeners. Um, that's all. Yeah, no, they, don't mean, worry. If they sue me, I'll I'll call you. Yeah. No, no, but I mean, I mean, that, I mean, really, I mean, that's what I think. I, I really think. No, I really think owning ten or twenty percent in gold, and you could do that with the GLD ETF, which which I do own. Is is a prudent thing to do at this point? All right, what is the G GLD? Explain that to her. It's a simple exchange traded fund, and it owns gold bullion. Uh, there, there's another fund called the Central Fund of Canada uh, that actually owns gold and silver. So if you want both, that I would look into that also. All right, should she have any in, mm -hmm. in physical go actual physical gold on her possession or silver? I, I mean, I do personally. I own some. Not not on me, but, you know, stored away <laughs> somewhere. <laughs> oh. uh, so, Mike, okay. you're, you're, oh, there you go. Okay, we lost you for a second. Uh, no, I, I mean, but well, well, let me say this about, about that. That's kind of an interesting thing, too, because I never, I, I've never, um, I, even though I've traded gold stocks and gold and this and that, I've never been someone that was owning physical gold uh, myself uh, up until about a year ago. And it was a curious experience. I went to a gold uh, dealer, a coin shop, and I, the first time I went, they acted like I, they hadn't had someone come in there in a long time, and they were trying to sell me collectible coins. Right, uh, that, yeah. That's where they make their money, yeah. Yeah, and I, 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 did, I was like, I don't, I don't, you know, don't buy collectible coins unless you know what you're doing. That's that's one thing I'll tell you because – they, they have different values to them than regular gold bullion. So if you buy physical gold, just buy the bars or gold eagles and keep it really simple. Uh-huh. Okay. That's, that's what I would do. I mean, that's what I do do. I, I just, I'm not, I don't know about collectible coins. That's a whole other world. And they, and they can trick you. People can trick you like collecting stamps or something. Yeah. You know, call them. You may want to ask uh -huh. your, your, your stock broker or whoever he is, you know, your fund manager, um, what if there's a severe downturn in the economy? What part of my portfolio would withstand that? And let's assume this is a severe downturn. How much, what portion of my portfolio do you suspect would be vulnerable to that? 
Now, if he says, well, most of it, then he says, well, I need to move it into something that will go in the reverse direction. And he may recommend, or he, she may recommend, that you put it in some, like GLD, which is an uh, electronic traded funds of, of gold stocks, you yeah. know, where you don't have to monitor uh -huh. it. Uh, the, the, the trade fund maintains just solid gold stocks in there as a safe haven for, for investors. I know many people who have done that. It's not risky at all, especially today with gold being so far down and the funds are so low in value that it almost has no place to go, but up for it to go any further down is very, very unlikely. You may want to take a look at that, although we don't give investment advice, we're just saying that ask your investment advisor to see uh -huh. if there's an alternative, if you have no alternative in their, um, in your portfolio right now. Yeah, and one thing about gold too, and I've told this to friends of mine over the past, let's say year or two, that kind of have the same, kind of have a situation, a lot of people have a situation where they just don't know what to do. And they'll say, you know, it's not so much they're losing money even, they could just, I'm, I'm not making anything, you know, stock market's going nowhere, what can I do? And with friends of mine that live in my area, I just, I, that's what I tell them. The simplest thing is just buy gold. And, and the thing about it, it, the other thing I'll say is kind of similar to what Joe said is, look, it, it doesn't cost, it's cost uh, around 1040 to mine an ounce of gold from the ground. It's around a thousand or so. Uh, and you know, today it's like 1220 or something. So let's say a thousand dollars is, is your risk. Uh, that that's, I don't think it's going to fall that much, but, or I don't really think it would, but that's, I'm just saying, say the argument, oh, 20% downside or 10% downside or whatever. If you just put 10 or 20% of your money in that, you're only risking a small percentage of your overall money, right? If I put 20% in gold and it falls 10%, I lose 2%. But the thing, the other thing about it is, it really appears to be positioned to go, it's cheap, it's not gonna fall but so much, and it's positioned therefore to go into a bull market, you know? Yeah. And so I think it's a good thing to buy just for the potential upside, regardless of, you know, thinking that, I have to own it for safety or in case the world ends or something like that, you know. It's very tough, you know, when people say, how can I make money in the market when, you know, at the moment, uh, the stock market really isn't doing that much. So yeah. you really have to make changes yeah. to, to do something. Well, well also, Cole, you have to understand that uh, it, yeah. it, it costs near $1,200 an ounce to mine gold because it's becoming more rare, more difficult to extract. And if gold goes down to a thousand dollars a share, a thousand dollars an ounce, these mines will close up. They'll just cease operations because they're unprofitable. Once they close up, there'll be a shortage of gold. And when there's a shortage of gold, the price of gold will go up. So you're almost at a point now that you can speculate. Now, this is speculation of, of course, what I'm talking about is speculate that if gold goes down, um, in price, it may pop back up naturally only because there'll be a shortage. So you're at a pretty good position right now. So um, I, I would recommend that uh, that you ask your stockbroker about that and see what he has to say. Now, for myself, I never have more than 100% okay. of my investment money in gold. Only kidding, <laughs> only kidding. Uh -huh. You know. Thank you very much for calling. Yeah. Do you have any other questions for our listener? Because we're almost out of time. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you very much for calling Liberty Talk Radio. Uh, Mike, we're, we're running out of time. The witching hour is almost here. We have in about a minute and a half or so. So let me give you this last minute to, um, to uh, summarize and promote your book, Stock Market Bubble, a, a bubble Bust of 2015 and Beyond. Buy the book and tell us something. Uh, close it out for us, okay? Yeah, sure. The one thing, uh, two things. One thing about the book is uh, the idea, the key, really the key part of the book for me was the and beyond part, not so much trying to predict a crash or something. Right. Uh, that's something that <laughs> the cover is designed to get sales, but I'm really trying to lay out a game plan for the future too, no matter what the stock market does. And if people want you know, to read uh, the, my market commentary or whatnot, they can go to my website, it's wallstreetwindow.com. Uh, and then I guess the final thing I'll say is, as far as the risks of the market or you know what we we're talking about before uh, a debt problem the key indicator I think to watch is J and K which is the junk bond ETF uh, that's the rate uh, charged to corporations for issuing bonds 
And if you know that's had a nice rally over the past couple of weeks, but if that makes a new low, uh, I, I think that would be a sign that uh, you know a lot of companies are the cost for them to issue more debt's going to go up. So a lot of them will stop doing it. You know they won't be doing these buybacks, and that would be a negative for the stock market. Yeah. Okay, Michael, thank you so much for being on our program. We do uh, wish that you would accept our invitation to return at a later date and give oh, us an update. Sure, be glad to do that. Okay, thank you so much for being on our show. Folks, Michael Swanson, author of the book, The Stock Market Bubble Bust of 2015 and Beyond. Thank you for being on our show. Folks, this is the end of today's broadcast. We'd like to thank our sponsors for the financial support, and we'd like to thank you for listening in. You can further the cause of liberty by recommending this program to your friends and let us hear from you. Our email address is comments at libertytalkradio.com. Remember, as my wife would say, you're either allowing your liberties to be taken away or you're striving to protect them. Unfortunately, there is no middle ground. Until next time, this is Joe Cristiano. You've been listening to Liberty Talk Radio. Stay well. Stay tuned.